This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. During the Great Depression, about a quarter of a million teenagers left home and hit the road. Most were searching for work, some were searching for adventure. They hopped freight trains and often slept in hobo jungles, the hobo camps on the outskirts of towns. The documentary Riding the Rails is about the teenagers who became hobos in the 30s. It will be shown Monday night on many PBS stations. Riding the Rails includes archival footage and interviews with former teenage hobos who are now in their 70s and 80s. We're going to hear from two of those former hobos on this archive edition of Fresh Air. Jim Mitchell left his home in Wisconsin when he was 16. Peggy DeHart left home in Wyoming when she was 15. Jim Mitchell later served in World War II and made promotional films for the auto industry. Peggy DeHart later ran a business with her husband and became a missionary in Trinidad. Peggy DeHart now lives in Spokane, Jim Mitchell in Kenosha. Mitchell told me why he started riding the rails. The, the railroad was the quickest way to get away from the misery of home. That's a, this, this simple answer is that get away from the, the unemployment, the relief lines. So we got on, so you go down, you grab a passenger train and, and head on down the road. Of course, you were about 30, 40 minutes into the rideway. You were cold and miserable, and if it were raining, you were in a mess, and you wish you were home, but you'd made your decision, and so that was it. it basically, you did it to just, just get away from, I did it to get away from the misery of, of the Depression. Peggy DeHart, how did you end up riding the rails? <laughs> I was working with my father. We lived on a ranch in Wyoming, and uh, very little money at hand and I was in high school and had no money for clothes and I was helping my dad milk and, and uh, an old cow switched me in the eye with her ta dirty tail and I got up and whopped her one and cussed her out and my dad came across the aisle and slapped me and I said I'll leave home and he says you'll be back for supper and about a week later I went to work for a neighbor for a dollar a week and I worked two and a half weeks and took my two dollars and a half and left with another girl to hitchhike and ride freight trains to Issaquah, Washington. I was gone uh, 33 days and uh, on the 33rd day I was home in time for supper. Jim, how long were you gone? Oh, I'd, <clears throat> these would be various sorties. I'd go out and I'd be gone for two or three weeks, sometimes a month, and then I'd come home and and uh, you'd be around and then you'd take off again. It was no uh, no long protract, and this this went on for over, oh, about a year, year and a half. Would you each remember for me the very first time you jumped a train? Sure. First time I damn near got killed. <clears throat> I went down to the railroad station, a buddy of mine. What you do is you get to the head of the platform, and you, you wait, and when the conductor says, aboard, then you... You wait, and the engine starts up, and, and it gain, when it gains speed and gets up toward the end of the platform, you run for the the ladder on the back of the tender and up and uh, into the blind of the first car. And I'll never forget, it was either the first or second sortie out. I was riding the blind with an old bomb across from me, and we each snuggled into our own side and held on for dear life about a couple of roads, a couple of stops down the road, an old bow, a bow got on that uh, he was a pretty scruffy character. And uh, he looked, and there was no place in the blind, and he had to hook, put his hook, foot around the ladder going up the tender. And so he had a bag that he had a bag uh, wrapped up in a, a, a rope, and he put it up on top of the tender. And he says, watch my bag, kid. And I, no, I said, not a chance, because I had all I could do to take care of myself. Well, the wind and the rattling of the rails pretty soon took that bag and smashed it against the car, and down into the wheels went all of this man's possessions. And with fire in his eye, he dashed over toward me, and he says, Damn, kid, I told you to watch my bag. And this old bow, I'll never, I don't know who he is, but I owe my... He stepped between us, and he says, You touch the kid, and I'll kill you. And the guy turned stone white, went back, and uh, that's one of my first trips on the train, and I'll never forget it. And uh, wherever that old bow is, I owe my life to him. Jim, would you describe what the blind and the tender are that you're referring to? Well, if you've seen motion pictures, there's a, there's an engine, a big black steel thing up in the front, driven by steam, and and back of that is a tender that ha that holds water and coal for creating the steam, and then that is that is hooked up to the first car, 
and the blind is lit, the blind is literally the door opening it's it's the it's where the door is and it's the coupling between the two two cars and if it's the first uh, car uh, right in back of the tender uh the blind it'll be open so you can stand in there sort of a little bit out of the wind and weather so when you were riding in the blind of the car you were actually riding more or less in between two cars that's right. You were riding. Life. Yes, you were riding between the first car and the tender of the engine. And um, Peggy, would you remember for us the first time you jumped a train? Yes, I I was in uh, Cokeville, Wyoming, which is uh, end of the world. And uh, my girlfriend with she was seventeen. I was fifteen. And uh, we walked. We were. Uh, going up the road and and having little luck in catching and thumbing a ride, and it was because we were too close to the state line, and uh, we walked by the the stockyards and here were some bums cooking a pot of stew and had coffee, and uh, they asked us if we were hungry and we always said yes, and we went in and ate with them and uh, they said well you kids are going to have trouble getting out of here because that state line's so close and in the 30s. People were very leery about carrying people over a state line, uh, especially young girls. And uh, so they said, why don't you just catch a freight with us? We'll, we'll help you. And uh, so uh, the freight came in and, and the water pump, the water where the, the steam engine watered up was right there. And they came in to water up and we caught a, a, a they helped us into a big car that had been hauling wheat, and there was paper inside of the walls. And uh, so they helped us on, and, and uh, as we left the station, we were all four sitting in the door of this boxcar, and I was swinging my legs, and uh, suddenly this one man slapped my shins and says, keep your legs down. Uh, you hit a switch on the railroad, it'll jerk you right off into eternity. And so I learned real quick, but they were very kind to us, and, and uh, in the, we rode that thing all that night and all the next day into the next evening to Napa, Idaho. They taught us how to roll up in the paper from the walls uh, to shield ourselves from the wind and the cold at night, and it did get cold at night, even though this was in late July. Did and you find uh, it hard to jump on a train that was moving? Yes, it was. Uh, uh, at Nampa, uh, we had to change trains, and uh, the uh, at the jungle where we were, there was a kind of an amphitheater, and it was filled with men. There was men everywhere. I have no idea how many, but there was only one boxcar on the whole train that was open, and it was there in front of that amphitheater, and the bulls were pacing up and down with their lanterns and their rifles. And uh, the bulls were the train so, cops. Yes, the railroad cops. Uh huh. And uh, we uh, so when the re when the train started, when it jerked loose, this whole body of people rose up like one person and rushed for that door. And I was the first one there. And somebody I had have no idea who picked me up by the nap of my neck and and the seat of my pants and pitched me into that car. And my girlfriend was right behind me, and she was carrying a tin suitcase of all things. We we crawled into a corner and set that suitcase up in front of us. It was very dark in there, and uh, these two men, one of them called out my name, and I answered, and they came and sat in front of us. Did men prey on you while you were on the road? No, I never had any, not not uh, riding the rails. We had uh, a one incident in a car. Of course, I was a kid, and I looked like a kid, and uh, people give me their change out of their pockets and fed us, you know, every time they had an opportunity. Jim, would you describe for me what it was like on, on a typical freight train when you were on a freight train, in a boxcar well, with other people? The thing Peggy was talking about, wrapping up in, in, in papers, is over, we call those, those were known pejoratively as, 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 as Hoover blankets. And it was a way to keep warm. You, and, and paper is a wonderful, wonderful way to keep warm. Most of the freight trains we ever rode on, we either rode on on the top, or we rode in empty cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, I must confess, I never rode with. There were not a lot of people on the trains that we we rode on. 
Jim, how would you decide where you wanted to go? You didn't. You you, you got on and you went. You did you did you didn't care where you went. Did, there was no you had no destination. Hmm. There was no destination. It was it was just like how did we know in the depression? How did we know it was ever going to end? We didn't know what it was going to happen during the depression. Is that, I, I think that that that's safe to say. I think isn't it? Isn't it, Peggy? We did. No, nobody knew. <laughs> well, I did. End. I had a goal. When I left Wyoming, I was headed for Issaquah, Washington. So I, it, oh, it was had, the okay. place where this girl's parents lived. Okay. So we did yeah. have a goal. And so when someone asked us where we were going, we could always say home, either direction, <laughs> because one of us had a home in that direction. Right. So we did have a okay. goal. Yeah. Well, you're getting you you well, you 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 this this is one you're getting two different perspectives on on the depression. As a matter of fact, if 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 I may, may, may I put the, f from my perspective, can I put the depression in, in perspective? Please go because, ahead. <clears throat> see, in the twenties, when when we was when I was ten, eleven years old, here Lindbergh had just just flown across the Atlantic. My father was working five and a half days a week. It, 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 everything was rosy. That radio was coming, and and the, the world was bright and cheerful. Then hit twenty nine. And things started to fall apart, and slowly the country started to deteriorate. And so, it was from that perspective that that I left left and went out, went bumming on the road, because when I was a boy, about fifteen, I, my father came home. I'll never forget this. He came home early one morning, and I was on my way to school, and and he come in, and I heard him come in, and he put his lunch bucket on the on the table and he and the first time I ever saw my father cry he was out of work and it was from that perspective that you wanted to get on the train and go you wanted to get away at least I did my guests are Jim Mitchell and Peggy DeHart they both were teenage hobos during the depression we'll talk more after a break this is fresh air Good afternoon. You're tuned to 91 FM WHYY. Riding the rails from the American Experience will be seen on TV 12 Monday night at 9 o'clock. So tune in for the American Experience Riding the Rails. That's Monday night at 9 on WHYY TV 12. <laughs> Back with Peggy DeHart and Jim Mitchell, two of the people featured in Riding the Rails, a documentary about teenage hobos during the Depression. Jim, what did your parents think of you going on the road? Your father was out of work. The family was hit hard by the Depression, but did they approve of you riding the rails? I never was scolded for it. I was never lectured to about leaving. I just, they, they trusted me. I'm certain that my parents trusted me. They didn't. And, uh, was it one less they, mouth to feed? Was it a relief that, in a that, way? That's 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 pretty much the size of it. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, that you could put it that way. And my father was busy every day, standing in long unemployment uh, in, in employment lines, trying to get what little bit of work he could. And so when you were gone, that was another. And they knew I was able to take care of myself, so they never really worried about me. So when I came home, I was welcomed home again. And when I left, you just left. Peggy, did you worry about your parents panicking when you took off? Well, of course I thought about that. I, I, you know, I know all about depression because our income, our liquid income was probably $300 a year. We were on a ranch, so we had our own milk, butter, and eggs. And there were three things that would always grow, corn, beans, and potatoes. So we had three things that we could always eat. And uh, so we never knew. I, there was just no money, and that's why I left. I wanted to earn some money to buy some clothes for high school. I rode four miles horseback to catch a bus to go into high school. Uh, we didn't consider ourselves poor because everybody where we lived lived the same way. Did either of you succeed in making money, which you both set out to do? No. You, know, you ask about making money. There was one source of income, at least for boys, and that were carnivals. And uh, you'd go and you'd hook up with a carnival and you'd for the night and you'd work as a shill. And uh, you could pick up a dollar or two and uh, that'd hold you over for a while. Jim, did you ever stay in one of the hobo jungles? Did you do that often? 
uh, I stayed uh, oh a couple of couple of nights. I've stayed in them, and uh, and, and slept under the trees. But I, I didn't stay very long. I I didn't like them because they were the, the, the characters among them. They were they were they were too weird for me. Mm -hmm. Where did you stay when you weren't staying in one of the jungles? You'd stay in a bar. You'd stay in barns. Uh, sleep uh, sometimes you'd even sleep in a jail and you'd go in and the first time we learned this trick you'd go into a small town and you'd you'd go into the you hear you're a kid about 15 16 years old and so you go into the policeman and you smile at him and say what's the smallest crime i can commit that'll put me in overnight and nine out of ten times he'd smile and he'd say come on follow me and he'd, he'd take you back and he'd say sorry but i've got to lock you up and then he You'd go in the cell and he'd lock the door and there you'd stay during the night. Next morning he'd let you out and you'd go and have some cup of coffee with the guys and take off and go down and find a restaurant there where you could get a a, a, a meal or try to earn some money and buy, buy a few rolls for some coffee. Peggy, I have a question for you that might seem a little indiscreet, but when men are riding uh, the rails and they have to relieve themselves, they can kind of, you know, do it fairly easily it's much more difficult for a woman especially a, wom a woman in a male subculture what did you do when you were riding the train for many hours at a shot and you had to relieve yourself only one time that I did and that was on the first railroad ride the first boxcar that we rode from Cokeville Wyoming to Nampa Idaho and uh, we we held, we had, there was paper in the room and, and, and in the boxcar, and there was only the four of us. And so my girlfriend would hold up this big sheet of paper from, torn from the walls to make a little privacy. And then I would do the same for her. But I did not relieve myself all the way from Napa, Idaho to La Grande, Oregon. There was no way. Wow. There was too many men in the car. And none of them did to my knowledge either huh I'm wondering if you both felt when you were on the road that you were turning into people you didn't recognize you know you you were unable to 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 bathe uh, you had no money you had little or no food you were being chased by the police and driven out of town and sleeping in jail I think for my for me it gave me more confidence to know that I could survive away from my family. It gave me confidence to know that even though there's a big world out there, there that you can survive and uh, you don't have to have uh, somebody helping you at home. You don't have to have four walls around you to, to be confident and to be able to get by. I mean it, it give it helped me in later years to have uh, the stamina to stand some of the rigors that I've had to go through. Jim, what about you? Did you feel like you were turning into somebody you didn't recognize? From my perspective, being on the road really was, was, was sort of like being in a fog. It was, it was a means of getting away. And I, I doubt if I psychoanalyzed myself. Uh, I, it, it, you just drifted. As far as I was concerned, and as far as being self-sufficient, uh, of course, I never thought much about that. I was uh, thought that I was fairly well self-sufficient. Did you each tell your children when you had children about your experiences during the Depression? Uh, not until they were grown. You waited that long? Yes. Jim? Well, you try to tell them, but they don't understand, and you can't explain it to them. You know, they, they've got all the food they want, they've got all the money they want, they've got cars, they've got everything. How can you explain when you don't have anything? That's why I don't know what would happen to this country if we ever if we ever hit another depression. I, I just can't imagine. Peggy, why did you wait till your children were grown to tell them? Well, I didn't want them doing the same thing. <laughs> and it was a different era, too. Uh, so I didn't want I didn't want the romance of the thing to get to them in their teenage years. I bet they were shocked when they found out what their mother had done. Well, I think they were somewhat, yes. Well, I want to thank you both very much for talking with us. Thank you for asking. Thank you.
Peggy DeHart and Jim Mitchell are both featured in the documentary Riding the Rails about teenage hobos during the Depression. The film will be shown Monday night on many public television stations. Our interview was recorded last year. Coming up, film critic John Powers reviews The Butcher Boy. This is Fresh Air. I'm Linda Wertheimer. Later on All Things Considered, Dorothy Allison writes about ordinary, extraordinary young women. You see them, she says, all over the South. They're very glossy on the surface. The hair is sprayed tied back in the faces of white queen, bright lipstick. A wall between them and the world. And if you can get one minute where you crack that wall, an enormous story is hiding there. Dorothy Allison's new book, Cave Dweller, later on All Things Considered. Also coming up, we'll have details and reaction about the uh, agreement settled on in Northern Ireland, about the political future of that region. And we'll also have a story about Love Canal 20 years ago, as the toxic chemicals began to ooze into homes, touching off a debate on the disposal of chemical waste. That's coming up from 4 to 6.30 on All Things Considered. Support for 91FM comes from John Harvard's Brewhouse in Springfield, Wayne, and Concord, where every month, five-course brewery dinners match honest food with real handcrafted lagers and ales. The Butcher Boy is a new film directed and co-written by Neil Jordan, who's best known for his films Mona Lisa and The Crying Game. Our film critic John Powers says Jordan's new movie is a black comedy on a difficult subject. Francie Brady, the 12-year-old hero of The Butcher Boy, is a real piece of work. He's saucy, heartbreaking, and a murderer. I'm not giving away any secrets by revealing this. It's the first thing that Francie, narrating his story as a grown-up, tells us about his younger self. The scene is a small Irish town in the early 60s, the days of A-bomb tests, TV westerns, and pop music. Francie is one of the poor kids. His father, Benny, played by Stephen Ray, is known for being a booze hound, his mother for being suicidally crazy. Trying madly to cope with his collapsing home life, Francie develops two frantic fixations. He's slavishly devoted to his best friend Joe, whom he's terrified of losing, and he detests Mrs. Nugent, a hoity-toity neighbor who looks down on Francie's family. He sees her as the source of all evil, and the movie's about why he kills her. The Butcher Boy is based on the novel by Irishman Patrick McCabe, who co-wrote the script with director and fellow countryman Neil Jordan. What McCabe and Jordan share is a feeling for the desolate poetry of provincial Ireland, with its pinched lives and miraculous visitations of beauty. This beauty includes the film's language, which is so singingly original that it makes David Mamet's vaunted dialogue sound like ad copy. Francie tells his story in one of the richest voiceovers I've ever heard, beautifully delivered by Stephen Ray, as in this scene when Francie watches his dad stumble drunkenly home and begin playing the trumpet. Me tonight, son. And there was there again, playing that lovely trumpet. And I heard him had brought back Ma and all the beautiful things like snowdrops and roses and flash bars and me and Joe by the lake. As if goldfish and nugents had never been invented. I'm sorry, son. I'm sorry. These melancholy words carry their sting because of Eamon Owens, the carrot-topped young actor who perfectly embodies Francie's cheeky exuberance and bottomless sadness. Owens had never acted before this movie, but in Jordan's hands, he's simply astonishing. He can make Francie's eyes blaze with joyous insanity or show how Francie works the ladies at the butcher shop with the wry savvy of a classic Irish politician. I'm not exaggerating when I say that not one of the recent Oscar winners gives a performance nearly as good as this boy's. Although Francie's a wonderful kid in some ways, he's also a psychopath. He has no proper sense of proportion, no true feeling for right and wrong. Hoping to take us inside the delirious extremes of such a childhood, the movie shifts moods wildly. There are dances in the snow, old TV clips, pedophile priests, blood-smeared walls, Sinatra tunes, games of cowboys and Indians, even sightings of the Virgin Mary, played by, of all people, Sinead O'Connor. This is a movie of grand flourishes, shot through with compassionate moments that touch the universal. When Francie realizes that he's losing his only friend, Joe, his despair taps into feelings of loneliness and betrayal that we all remember from our childhoods. 
In its willingness to turn misery and murder into sardonic comedy, The Butcher Boy is quintessentially Irish. It's a culture famous for laughing through clenched teeth. This is not an especially American way of looking at life, let alone a murdering child. In fact, in the wake of the Jonesboro killings, I imagine some viewers will find the picture's rollicking energy insensitive, even morally reprehensible, as they did with Heavenly Creatures, a comparable, if lesser, film a few years ago. But art's true purpose isn't moral instruction, thou shalt not kill. It's insight. Why do we kill? To understand the Jonesboro murders means getting inside the heads of the boys that did the killing. To grasp the surreal blend of anger, self-pity, and sheer glee that might lead them to open fire on other children. Which brings us back to the butcher boy. There are no lessons here about gun control or family values. But if you want to know how it feels to be a boy who commits cold-blooded murder, this great movie, the best of Neil Jordan's career, will show you the mysterious monstrosity lurking in childhood. John Powers is film critic for Vogue. We were very sorry to learn that the drummer Dennis Charles recently died. He died of heart failure March 26th at the age of 64. Dennis Charles was best known for his work with Cecil Taylor, Steve Lacey, Archie Shepp, Gil Evans, and Billy Bang. He was also the drummer in a group led by composer and pianist Joel Forrester, the composer of the Fresh Air theme. That band is called People Like Us, and their latest CD, In Heaven, was just released. We'll close with music from it. I'm Jerry Gross. Fresh Air comes from the listeners of WHYY in Philadelphia, where Fresh Air is...